Well, it's a beautiful Thursday morning, and thanks for joining us. It's time for us to go through the pages of our dailies. We call it Off the Press. Ezekiel Nyai took joins us via Zoom this morning, all the way from Akwaibom State. Uh, it's good to have you join us. Otoeko. <laughs> well, we hope that we are able yeah, to... Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, Dan, thank you so much. Let's start off with the leadership newspaper this morning has been made available by a paper vendor we also have all the papers uh, in front of us but i'll take a look at the leadership it talks about 2023 tunubu or be on war path over supporters utterances uh, that's what you find call them to order apc presidential candidate tells the labor Part presidential flag bearer and says biafra obedient members are beds of a feather it's height of mischief to link my supporters to separatists. That's what will be quoted to say. Pope hasn't told me to reject APC campaign DG appointment. La Long is quoted on that. And Plateau Governor's emergence or emergency has pacified northern APC Christians. Stakeholders are quoted to say. I mean, this is a right as you find underneath the caption. Uh, you find federal government can't borrow 1.1 trillion naira to meet ASU's demand. David Umai is quoted to say, and dozens infected with new Langyang virus in China. It just was we're grappling with, you know, COVID, monkey pox, uh, what have you. Train attack terrorists, free family of six women. Uh, terrorists, free family of six women. And Kenya election, it's still photo finish for Odinga and Ruto. Uh, that's what you find. And just before we move away from the leadership, be firm in discharging your duties. Federal government's orders new correctional officers. These are the headlines, uh, some of it on the leadership. And straight to the nation newspaper, we have the following headlines. A big one there. PDP crisis, why are you must quit now by ex-party chair. PDP crisis, why are you must quit now by ex-party chair. Uh, writer to that body, George, chairman, candidate, can't come from same zone, one zone. That's what body George is saying. The chairman can candidate, uh, can't come from one zone. And Shawiki uh, had made the, that request via his, uh, his group, his supporters, his uh, men. They also made that request as well. Uh, EFCC to try three officials for altering pardon list. That's an interesting one to look into. NSCIA, CAN signed 2023 Peace Pact, talking about the Nigerian Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs and the Christian Association of Nigeria. Um, it's interesting to see the two, <laughs> two religions cooperating. So I uh, hope that leads to better things ahead of 2023. You don't want to see people fighting because of religion. Train attack, terrorist free family of six hostages. A rain in your supporters, Tinubu campaign tells Obi and Nakeridolu urges Nigerians to shun religious division. As some stories from the nation take the final two APC neck meeting for next month and bandits abduct five family members. Those are the headlines on the front page of the nation. Away from the nation, uh, we take a look at the Punch newspaper. Dwindling revenue, Nigeria facing essential threat, World Bank warns. And uh, that's boldly written on the punch now. You find the writer saying, says country ranks lowest in income among 115 countries. And says subsidy should go. Federal government borrows 2.45 trillion naira from the Central Bank of Nigeria in six months despite fiscal risks. Uh, interesting. And 2023, wrong choice will consume Nigeria, says former president Tulisha Gunabasandro. And federal government to generate 484 billion naira from e-payment channels. Terrorists release seven Kaduna train passengers, abduct five. And over massacre, security agencies begin manhunt for financiers. Robbers strike again, escape, please make excuse. And 12-year-old kills Nigerian mother and U.S. blames intruder. I mean, that story was also uh, retold after a time. He gave a different story. And then he said it was an accidental discharge. And the police is also 
corroborating that particular one. But that's the much we can take this morning on the Punch newspaper. The final paper on our table is the Daily Trust. Um, it goes with these, this lead story, Muslim Muslim ticket as a kicker. And the headline, Pope not against my Tinubu's campaign DG offer, Lalong. Interesting, yeah, that the Pope has been brought into this conversation. Pope not against my Tinubu's campaign DG offer. Along that side of paper put it, puts it. And it says, Shatima selection, not a religious affair. Obese supporters defaming me, Tinubu. It's not true, LP presidential candidate. Interesting one. More from Daily Trust. Buhari supports regulator. Backs down on separate purchase of Exxon Mobil asset. It seems like a game of musical chairs uh, or merry-go-round, if you want to call it that. How Kaduna Scholarship Loan Scheme is changing indigent students' lives. How Kaduna Scholarship Loan Scheme is changing indigent students' lives. Jai's bank grows balance sheet to over 300 billion naira. 2023, Sultan can sign pact to de-escalate religious situation. Early signs show tight Kenyan presidential election, 109 billion naira fraud. Ex-accountant General Idris seeks plea bargain and Dari to run for Senate after prison release. <laughs> oh my God. Um, let, let's start from there because that's the last paper. Uh, Ezekiel, architect Ezekiel Yaitug, your thoughts on the possibility of uh, an ex-convict. Um, not that he's, he's not, um, he doesn't have his rights. Uh, Joshua Dari, Dari, who just got a, a pardon um, being uh, in the Nigerian Senate. You see, N Nigerian politics has been um, something that causes me a worry and concern. The, the concept of interests have to be very, very carefully looked into because we have been to draw a line between politics and governance. You know, we, we have failed to realize that this vehicle that we are admiring was actually intended to take us somewhere. So sitting and admiring the vehicle without the essence being explored becomes a worrisome um, issue. Why am I saying this? A man comes from prison and he's going to run for an office for the Senate. Now, I wouldn't be bothered if this guy has been so competent, he's been somebody that has such high level of integrity, and if you get to run public polls, they will say, yes, he was a victim, and now we really want him to come and continue his good services. If that was the case, then I can understand. But that's definitely not the thinking, the mindset in Nigeria. The thinking is like, who will help me win election? Who will be able to bring the, his, his, his um, political you know, sagacity, as it were, to help me win election. I, I, I wish that um, we had a different mindset as to our uh, leadership recruitment criteria. It's just, I'm almost sounding discordant, but uh, it's, it, 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 it's troublesome, it's, it's worrisome, it, it bothers a lot that we are, at this point, not able to lay emphasis on what good governance and the imperatives are. All right, Ezekiel and I took, let's quickly take a look at the leadership newspaper. Um, Dave Umai might just be holding brief for the federal government. Uh, he says the federal government can borrow 1.1 trillion naira to meet assets demand. And yet we also have reports where, you know, the finance minister is saying, hey, we gave approval for 1.4 billion naira for vehicles for officials in Niger Republic. What do you make of this? It all comes to our understanding of the essence of governance. That's the foundation, that the, 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 the bottom line. Now, the government is not sincere. The government is not transparent. And for us, to, it's like two can play. You tell me you don't have money to pay me, and this is the way you are spending money. It just doesn't add up. If you don't have money, let me understand you don't have money. Let's all understand we don't have money. Let's all make sacrifices. How do you remunerate the politicians? 
If there is a financial issue, let's all suffer it. That's why there's, there's a bill that's being proposed by the presidential candidate of ADC, Kachiko, which is uh, let, let the leadership enjoy what the followerships enjoy. Can we stop their children from schooling abroad if you want to seek public office? Can we stop them from going abroad for medical treatment? Can we all enjoy what the citizens enjoy and suffer what the citizens suffer so that we now know that when there's no money, or there's no money, we make sacrifices? So for us, so they have a point. I'm sorry to say they have a point because you can't tell me to tighten my belt when you are loosening your own belt. It doesn't add up. If it's not there, we know it's not there. On the other hand, the truth is that Nigeria does not have bad money. So you can see it's two people playing games, like two elephants fighting, and who is suffering? The future of Nigeria. When you look at them as students, don't get the picture. These are not students. These are the future of Nigeria. And I think it's high time that we, the, the, we call ourselves elders and patriots, we to come out way into this conversation and let us tell people the imperative, the, especially at the time like this, for us to profile those who want to be our president, those who want to be our governors. That time, that conversation has to be now because where these are, they are just going to the coastal right. They just roll up right. We are just going to continue like that. Let us hope that we don't continue like that and then roll into the next dispensation for another four to eight years. Let's rather use this period as a transition period where we enlighten the people on the imperatives of good governance and leadership so that we start to have a paradigm shift. Is it can you talk? Let's even delve into this issue. It's a big problem for us as a country. Um, if you look at it, the issue of revenue uh, seems to be posing a lot of threat, uh, you know, to every sector of the economy. And to be realistic, uh, the government is saying they don't have money. That's what it means. And the only option is to borrow. So um, how do we solve this problem of um, you know, revenue generation of having what it takes, you know, to finance, I mean, basic projects or, you know, capital infrastructure rather than relying on borrowing. I'll tell you this, and I just need to hear me and hear me well. I'm a private sector person. I come into my office, I check the books, and I discover that, wow, my revenue and my expenditure have a problem. The first thing that comes to my mind is, is it possible for me to rev up my revenue? Is it going, yeah, I took... Well, we seem to have lost uh, connection with Ezekiel and Yai. Took as soon as we're able to establish contact, we'll definitely have him. But we're back here in the studio. Uh, Ezekiel, Yai took. Yes, I'm back. Thank you. All right, thank you. Go ahead. I'm asking, can I rev up my revenue in any way? If I can't, the second part is sort of financial re-engineering by to put down and resize either my workforce or the project that I'm having. Now, we are at that point in Nigeria where we need to put our conversation to asking this presidential candidate, to what extent do you know for a fact the current financial standing of Nigeria? And that applies to everybody who wants to be a governor as well, because Nigeria is not just a federal government, it is also the state federating unit, and the FCT, FCT goes with the federal government. Now, what is current owner's financial standing? What are our obligations? And what are our remuneration status? Can we look at areas that we can trim down, downsize? And that does not actually mean retrenchment. It means the remuneration of our public office holders. Does the president need to have the number of feet he has in his jet, he has in his fleet? 
do National Assembly need to have a bicameral or a unicameral assembly? Do they need to be of full time or part time for now? These are the conversations, and do they need to have the numeration, remuneration? That where are we spending our money? If you do a, a, a synthetic analysis of our budget, you look at the capital and then the recurrent, you discover that it comes on the recurrent and we borrow to fund current. And it's just I'm an architect, but I don't need rocket science to know that you don't borrow because recurrent does not repay. Or you cannot show me the, the nexus between paying the man and his productivity being so much so that it will be able to generate enough income to repay. The mindset is let me just manage and live. Manage and live. No politics of tomorrow. So there has to be an interface between the government and the people where that interface has to put a certain um a certain weight of responsibility on government to think of the next generation and not just the next election. All right. Um uh, is it going to let, let's stay with the uh, the Daily Trust, and this story is also uh, captured by a number of other papers as well. Uh, despite the the rhetoric going around, especially from supporters uh, or opponents of uh, the All Progressives Congress and its same faith ticket, uh, we have the Sultan and the Christian Association of Nigeria. Some papers will say the uh, National Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs or the Nigeria Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs, whichever it is, uh, signing a pact uh, to de-escalate religious tension ahead of 2023. I think uh, you would agree that this is a very welcome development. Ordinarily, yes. It depends on the degree of sincerity of the two bodies involved. And I want to be generic. I want to be general rather. Um, when the, 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 the Islamic body have their in-house meeting, what is their honest mindset? When the Christians have their in-house meeting, the leadership, what is their honest disposition? Is it to defend their faith and interest? or to think of the corporate good of the nation in totality. Now, I would expect the Christian to think of the generality of the people. I am a Christian, and I know that the Christian faith preaches love and accommodation. As a matter of fact, if you are a real Christian, you are almost going to think of your neighbor more than yourself. You know that God eventually said, love your neighbor and love yourself. Which means put your neighbor at par with yourself. And that neighbor is not defined by your religious inclination. It's devoid of class or any form of um, divides. I don't know about the Muslim religion. So I know that the Christians should think of not only themselves, but their brethren. On the other hand, nobody is going to feel endangered. So while the Christian wants to feel patriotic, they need to know that they are saved and accommodated and they have their rights within the Constitution to have whatever it's their entitled. And the nation, by the us as a, a, a state that is not subject to a particular religion. Now, that is not properly animated in the constitution itself. There's a lot of discrepancies because while you can hardly find the word Christian or Jesus in the constitution, you can't think of any, Muslim, Muhammad, and all those are written in the constitution. Well, we really need to have a conversation as a nation on how we really want to treat the supposed secularity of Nigeria. So that deceit makes each person be cautious, you know, and um, it's not um, very... Um, uh, a lot of times when they have this conversation, things are caught and things like that, I find it difficult to really know how honest they really are. 
Okay, um, we'll still come back to the economy, but this time it's on the Punch newspaper. It talks about the warning of the World Bank, uh, talk, uh, Nigerian facing existential threat, and the fact that we rank lowest in income among 15, 115 countries. They're insisting that subsidy must go. I, I think that I have always said that there is something absolutely insincere there on patriotic, and I'll say devilish about this kind of subsidy. You can tell me how much is being put. The figures don't add up. Some years back, I've said this before, there was an audit where we were supposed to be consuming about, you know, 35 million liters per day. And they said, no, that 35 is an exaggeration. It should actually be in the neighborhood of 25 million liters. After that period, we've had the COVID, where there was a global meltdown. We had economic recessions. And within this same period, yet people cannot move freely because of their restriction in their finances. The figure has moved at a rate to over a hundred million, and then coming back to hover around twice the higher figure of the past. How how does this add up? And who is saying something about it? And worse still, it all runs within the concept of sub TD. That is one full part of argument. The second part of argument has to do with who is really being subsidized. We are using the poor as a bait, and we are using the name of the poor to enrich the rich. Why do I say so? If you aggregate the consumption of the poor in this whole thing, all those menial people, they are the saloon generators, the bike riders, and you put all those things, they amount to less than 10% of consumption. 10% is a gross, gross exaggeration of the figure. The other 90% is consumed by the banks that have fleet of cars, the corporate bodies that have fleet of cars, and then the, 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 the bourgeois that have these SPDs, these V8 engines that just consume it well like no man's business. So who are you subsidizing? The 10%, which is an exaggeration, or the 90%? And think in terms of the amount of money that is involved now running into trillions. It's a big job. Let's sit down and have an honest conversation on how we can forget subsidy and then empower the poor. Just 50%. 50%. So that we can keep 50% to ourselves and bring that other 50% to set up an honest body like they tried to do with PTDF. Ask how can we solve the problems of the poor honestly, sincerely, in a way that the poor can feel, yes, I've been accommodated. At the end of the day, if the poor are being given 10%, of the resources, they would have been given 50% of the resources. The country would have spent 50% of what they've been spending before and would have earned additional 50% which they can use in other things. And then we would have been a situation where the poor is the better off. I think this is just a simple mindset that we should apply to this subsidy camp. All right, Ezekiel, I'll keep you on the business lane um, or in the economy. Uh, we stay with the punch as well. Um, it says FG to generate 484 billion naira from e payment channels. That sounds like music to our ears when we look at how difficult it's been in terms of revenue generation for and the fiscal, a fiscal crunch uh, for this present administration. 
but for the past few years, 484 billion naira from e payment channel. Now, what the bunch is saying is that the federal government is set to make a total of 483.73 billion naira in three years from the electronic payment boom uh, by way of electronic money transfer levy. Uh, this projection was made by the Budget Office of the Federation and revealed in its 2023 to 2025 uh, medium-term expenditure framework and fiscal strategy paper. Uh, of course, it goes on to say in the next two paragraphs, uh, the, this is a single one-off charge of 50 naira on electronic receipts or transfer of money deposited in any deposit money bank or financial institution on any type of account on sums of 10,000 naira and above. So when you send that money to me, sir, maybe you do uh, a, a, a test. <laughs> That's 50 naira charge that is going to, you're going to see as extra is what they've been collecting. And this amounts to 483.73 billion naira in the past, um, in, 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 in three years, in three years, um, or two years, right? This is amazing. But I want to talk about it in light of the fact that we are even seeing more taxes. With this e-payment levy or e-levy up there, we're still going to be charged some more uh, for the data we use and the calls we make. I'll tell you this. I went to, in the car. Yes, I went to Rwanda to register a company with my friend. And they gave me a console. You know, within 30 minutes, it was done. And then they told me six hours, you get your certificate. I did everything and then brought out my card and I was told, no, you don't need to pay a dime. I'm telling you a life situation. You don't need to pay a dime. And then rather, we want to help you incubate your business to become profitable because when it becomes profitable, then we are able to get tax from you that makes sense. For instance, if you have two cows, one is very lean and you keep taking the milk, keep taking the milk. The milk just comes in trickles because it's very, but another man fattens the cow and the cow is very rich and then the, the milk just, just keeps popping. Nigeria believes in that, that, that cow that's almost dead. Just keep draining whatever is there so that you can have even a cup of milk for your own tea. Even if that cow dies, that's his business. But the mindset should be, how do we encourage Nigerians, how do we fatten them, so that willingly, out of patriotic instinct of, oh, my country helped me to come to where I am today, we can now willingly pay whatever taxes. The government is looking for every way to bring back the charges on the people. And let me say this. There seems to be a very good understanding, and it's not difficult to understand, to see, between the government and the banks. Now, all these charges that are being made, is this money going to come from what the banks have been collecting already? Can you tell the banks, what are you collecting these monies for? Or are they going to transfer it back to the people to pay more so that they can make more money? How many people have looked at the balance sheets of the bank and it is a lot of business going on within the back end of banks? A lot of things. This, this unclaimed dividends, these dormant accounts, these are all sorts of things, deposits that are not accounted for. You know, there's this understanding between the banks and the system. All right, it's a call. We work against the people. It's like we have to so go. if they want to make, yeah, let me just say, they may want to make more money, but the question is, at whose expense? That's the line I want to know. All right. All right. Thank you, Ezekiel Nyaito, for being part of the breakfast. Uh, we have to go now because we're out of time. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure all the time. All right. Great insight you have brought to the papers this morning. And that's the size of what the press would return tomorrow with more interesting headlines and conversation analysis coming your way. When we return, it'll be time for us to be looking at our first major topic right here. Please stay with us.